So in this presentation, the three major topics that I'll cover um, related to entry points into OSG and how that matters for supporting your researchers are, uh, first I'll discuss how you and your researchers today can use OSG by accessing OSG Connect, um, which is the set of endpoints that OSG operates into the open science pool. Um, I'll talk about learning opportunities for researchers and campus staff uh, along the lines of DHTC compute execution, DHTC facilitation, um, and even systems administration. Uh, although Greg mentioned a few of these two relevant specifically to, to Condor and if you're administering Condor systems. And then I'll talk about how this might relate to whether your campus in the future decides that it might like to have its own submit point and some of the things that come along with um, operating your own sort of submission point or access point into OSG. Um, so we've already kind of driven this home, but just to remind, there are a variety of different stakeholders who contribute resources to OSG, who use resources um, through OSG. And um, the OSG is really organized to some extent um, as computing resources provided to um, several different research communities. And we've mentioned that there are some larger physics collaborations like those that discovered the Higgs boson, CMS and Atlas, um, and a number of others that have their own pools. Even some campuses continue to have their own pools. Um, but it's no longer required that as a campus, you operate all of the infrastructure and instances of OSG software that are necessary for maintaining your own pool. Rather, for some time now, we've operated um, the open science pool. And for those of you who may have heard the terms virtual organizations, this is a, another sort of more technical term for how we Lauren, I think you're muted there. Sorry. How long have I been muted? Just just five seconds. Okay. Thanks. Someone may have hit unmute or mute all. So it's backing up the, the open science pool has been referred to in the past as the OSG VO, where each of these VOs represents the pool of resources and researchers or sort of the community of researchers that use those. So um, this open science pool is where we, um, you know, ongoing into the future are submitting researchers from campuses, whether via entry points that we operate like OSG Connect or their own entry points, as well as uh, smaller multi-institutional collaborations um, who don't yet want sort of the burden of operating their own pool. Um, and this is also where we can very effectively support gateways who want to use the open science grid as a compute backend. So somebody asked before about the sort of breadth of campuses and research that happens in the open science grid and in the open science pool, which again represents a more broad and diverse research community and a greater number of campuses. Um, I've got data here breaking down um, some of our top fields of science that have benefited from the open science pool um, and also uh, similar data categorized by the institution that they're submitting from. <clears throat> And you'll even notice that um, our top project or top institution in the last year is folding at home. And that was because um, we did a fair amount to prioritize COVID-19 research, which folding at home had no end of um, given the recent pandemic. But you'll also see in this list of institutions that there are some smaller institutions. What you don't see here is that there are a much larger number of campuses that researchers who use the open science pool come from, including campuses that have no local computing resources. Um, I'll mention we've, we've had researchers from Arcadia University, which is a smaller institution in the South, um, from smaller liberal arts colleges, primarily undergraduate institutions even, um, where there's still some amount of computational research going on, even if it's not enough to justify significant local resources. And that's, I think, a great benefit of the open science grid and the open science pool, that we're able to bring the scale of this system um, to researchers who may not have much to rely on locally. Um, as far as entry points into the open science grid, um, Frank mentioned, and we've previously discussed that OSG develops and maintains um, software that does the meta scheduling between users who submit their access points and various sources of computing capacity. <clears throat> and so in the open science pool, we're operating all of that. 
um, where a researcher at an access point, be that at a campus or through an OSG operated access point, um, will typically you know, access the opportunistic capacity of nationally shared clusters, um, like some of which your campuses might share or are already sharing through the open science grid. Um, and these come from a variety, again, of institution sizes and, and research computing capabilities. Um, but importantly, through features in Condor that Greg mentioned earlier, um, a researcher from any access point can submit into the open science pool um, and can activate resources with our help and the help of Condor that may be on a national supercomputer like an Exceed resource to specifically use allocation that belongs to them or to loop in commercial cloud resources that will only run their jobs similarly. Um, and with that also comes tools in Condor to control how much money is spent and when to shut things down and, and all of that. And so again, this allows the user to have this kind of submit local and run global experience where they submit Condor jobs that look the same regardless of where they're going to run, that specify the resources that um, they need and then can run on this heterogeneous, highly varied set of resources. And through national supercomputers and commercial clouds, this is one option for a researcher who might have a mix of, you know, very straightforward, high throughput, small, short jobs and longer or larger jobs, perhaps using higher memory or longer run times through national supercomputers and commercial cloud. So the service that I've mentioned that OSG operates as an entry point, we call OSG Connect. And like I've mentioned, you can go there today and request an account and someone on our research computing facilitation team will arrange a meeting with you such that you can get up and going in less than a week. Um, it's available to researchers and really anybody affiliated with a US academic government or nonprofit organization. We can even support researchers who are not at those institutions but are part of a project that's out of one of those institutions. <clears throat> and we have online documentation, some of which I've mentioned in previous discussion sessions on how to deploy software on the open science grid, how to use Condor to express your jobs. Um, but that meeting with the user initially plays a really important role, especially because they may be coming from their laptop or from a local HPC style cluster that's, that's organized fairly differently and that comes with different sets of advantages um, that may not have worked so well for their high throughput computing work. And there's no allocation or proposal required. You literally go to the OSG Connect website and on our front page very prominently is a button to sign up where you can authenticate through your home institution. <clears throat> and then we create your account based upon that authentication um, and you can log into our submit points after meeting with us. In the last year, users through OSG Connect used a vast majority of the resources in the open science pool, which was up near around 300 million. Um, and we've had an increase in the number of active projects over the last year, particularly um, starting with the COVID pandemic and running through the summer. And we typically see some peaks throughout the summer. And if you look closely here, you'll also see that um, some of our top projects, like I mentioned, were COVID-19 relevant projects. Um, and this usage and, and set of projects and researchers really cut across a wide range of research domains, um, you know, just like the data I showed that was aggregate for the entire open science pool. Um, I mentioned before um, earlier today that we see applications for high throughput computing in a wide variety of, of computational research types like text analysis, which at its core, you know, can be broken up into pieces. Text can be analyzed in pages or, or paragraphs rather than, you know, whole pieces of text. Um, we see people similarly with, uh, you know, doing data analysis on genomic data sets with many samples or many reads that can be considered independent, um, which ultimately is very similar to text analysis. Um, we see people with parameter sweeps or other types of simulations that have just a large number of initial starting conditions, whether those be different physical conditions or like, more like I said, a simple parameter um, estimation, other forms of statistical model optimization and simulations therein, um, and other types of analysis of multiple pieces of data like image analysis, video analysis, um, and any other type of, of analytics of multiple pieces of data, which is really what we're often talking about when we say things like big data in research. 
Um, beyond the indicators based upon the research problems and the methods that researchers are using, um, we also see signs and you will see signs of HTCable work, perhaps on your local computing systems if you operate some for your campus. Um, any mention of numerous samples, images, models, parameters, et cetera, when you talk to researchers is of course uh, a good sign, but um, frequently anything written by the researcher, um, especially in languages like Python or R, which are really popular, especially in research domains that are newer to large scale computing in the last decade, like life sciences, social sciences, frequently when researchers are writing their own code internally, what they're doing is, is considering a, a big data problem with lots of pieces or lots of independent computations or simulations. Um, even some community softwares that use multi-threading or multi-processing, even MPI, are applying that approach of optimizing performance for problems that are really well suited to high throughput. They're simply looping over many independent data portions or tasks. Um, and in some cases, but not all, it can be really trivial to break up the input data um, or turn off the multi-threading and run those executables with different subsets of the data and combine the results later. Um, additionally, long running jobs, which we already discussed before the break, but frequently long running jobs are signs of, of um, what might internally be lots of independent tasks that are being looped over. Um, there are exceptions to that, but the exceptions often lend themselves well to self checkpointing. And so then a user with few long jobs might be able to run many more of them with high throughput computing. So that's how we think about, is it high throughput computable? And um, at UW-Madison, for example, and some of the other campuses that contribute to OSG, um, we have a, a local HTC optimized compute system. It's much larger than our MPI specific compute system because many more researchers um, and research domains have high throughput computing problems. And we can support very large amounts of data there. We can support um, a more heterogeneous set of use cases um, you know, even things that are not high throughput, but are like large memory in a single compute system where anything runs on a single node or less versus needing multi-node MPI type infrastructure. But when we think about whether something is OSGable, um, that's a slightly narrower subset of use cases. Reason being that the OSG, though it provides really tremendous scale is still made up of opportunistic compute capacity that's not guaranteed for say really long running jobs or that may not be available in the form of you know, very large chunks of computing resource like multi-node high memory type jobs need. So we frequently, and in fact, in our documentation, um, talk to users about ideal jobs and what they can expect to get out of OSG given the job sizes that uh, are um, applicable to their compute problem. So we show a table like this one um, relatively frequently where this far left column um, is sort of like ideal jobs. Think of ideal jobs in OSG as being laptop sized. They can run on a single core, even if you've got many of them up to millions of them or more. Um, they run in well under a day, maybe less than half of a day. They need a laptop sized amount of memory, maybe a few gigabytes or less um, and have relatively small input or output per job. And in fact, these values of input and output per job, so per file per job are um, what is reasonable for an OSG user to have Condor transferring data directly from the submit point um, where we rely on fast um, ample amounts of local disk for staging um, to and from execute nodes. Um, still very advantageous where OSG can still make a, a significant difference for your researchers versus what they might have access to locally are jobs up to a relatively small number of multiple cores, say eight, simply because all of the resources across OSG may not even have much more than that per node. And more importantly, they'll be broken up running, you know, multiple smaller jobs. And so there's just less, uh, a lower rate of turnover of larger slots. Um, or with the expectation that a job run on a single server with that many cores, it, it would have to wait perhaps for um, other small jobs to finish to make a slot that large. Um, similar considerations for memory as well. Um, we can and, and still recommend that researchers run jobs in OSG if they're less than about a day long. If they're longer than about a day long and can't be checkpointed in some way, OSG might not be suitable. Or the researcher might be able to make changes, as we've mentioned, such that OSG can bring them scale that 
makes their effort worthwhile. And then we can support um, input and output per job up to tens, low tens of gigabytes actually, um, through the caching mechanisms that we've mentioned. So anything outside of that in the last column is not going to be very OSGable. Um, and the way that we help make sure that researchers understand this, besides the fact that it's in documentation and that we promote it through um, outreach and engagement like today's workshop, <clears throat> is the really con critical component for high throughput computing, especially today, in research computing facilitation. Um, and this is part of why we meet with every researcher at the beginning of their OSG interests so that we can help them best strategize and given their background and their compute requirements, you know, game the system of OSG as best as possible. So we're providing very personalized guidance. That's part of why we meet um, because some of this isn't very discernible just by having them fill out a form, for example. Um, we try to teach researchers to fish, which is a critical component, for example, of helping them be able to handle their software dependencies um, with the portability tools in OSG. And this model of research computing facilitation, in fact, the term of research computing facilitators, like I mentioned before, um, was pioneered in Wisconsin. Um, and so we've written about this, um, and it's the same paper where we published also data on exactly what the usage has been across our high throughput computing and high performance computing resources locally, where we know that the vast majority of what researchers are doing these days with computing is really high throughputable. So what's different about OSG facilitation? And I'll walk you very briefly through how we perform this, though we have ample opportunities for campuses to learn side by side with our facilitators. Um, first, high throughput computing, distributed high throughput computing systems are, are frequently new to users. They, they're coming from a laptop, like I mentioned, or they've maybe used a local HPC cluster with a shared file system and software modules for everything they've needed. Um, but also they're thinking differently about splitting up work um, and, and optimizing throughput versus or instead of optimizing per job performance um, in order to, to increase the rate of science that they can tackle. Um, most of them have HTC will work and don't know it. We have people who come to us on OSG Connect with one use case and then by talking to us realize that they have other use cases that would be really well advanced by OSG with a little bit of effort um, or maybe not much at all. Um, to tweak how they've been thinking about executing that work. And then because OSG is inherently different because it's distributed um, from a singular local homogeneous resource, um, we make sure that they understand that their data will be moved, how to express their data dependencies and, and achieve software portability through the submit file um, and where they don't have to understand the technology of the open science grid, but know how to implement it. Um, we also talk about the inherent interruption retry and, you know, part of that boils down to sort of the principles of high throughput computing that it's much more about being able to compute in as many spots as possible, even some places that might interrupt your jobs and cause them to restart. Um, but that's way better than if you were only running on a much smaller subset of resources that could guarantee that you won't be interrupted. And then testing and troubleshooting are a little bit different as well, given that a researcher can't expect that they can necessarily log in directly to a place where their job is running and try to do live troubleshooting. Um, but that's also part of why our research computing facilitators are there to help with tried and true methods that we know how to implement for handling different use cases that run in the open science grid. Um, and of course the potential scalability and potential for research transformation may be quite different than what they've experienced. So we're always pushing them to think bigger um, as we meet with researchers. And so here's what our process look like, looks like. And you can shadow us. If you send researchers to OSG Connect, you can be there right alongside us to see this and to join in. Um, but like I mentioned, we meet with everyone who gets into account on OSG Connect. We ask progressively for details like, um, tell me about your research in general and what your goals are, what questions are you answering? Then how does computing fit in? Um, we try to identify near-term bottlenecks without necessarily asking specifically what is your bottleneck, but um, by asking questions like how are you running things now, um, what are the computed data requirements, what's that like for you on your laptop um, or on the cluster you've been using, and that also gives us information typically with other guided questions about that person's computing background. Are they programming things themselves? Have they used any queuing scheduling systems before, which can be an advantage but can also mean we need to kind of retrain how they think about um, queuing systems. Um, 
and then ultimately what we want to get to thank you ultimately what we want to get to is how much or how big would you like to run uh, because then we can start to have a conversation about um, how much that researcher can get out and and achieve and maybe tackle more of if they tweak things to make their work executable in a high throughput environment or move it from their laptop um, to OSG where they can run the same thing, but many, many more times. We talked to them about what the open science grid is, about the different mentality and principles of high throughput computing. We make sure that they know where their jobs sit and how much throughput they can expect to game the system of OSG um, when we have this discussion. And then we follow up with a personalized plan and we try to make ongoing support as accessible as possible, emphasizing that people should bug us um, so that they take that seriously. So like I mentioned, um, and I may go just one or two minutes over, but we've got the cushion for that. Um, you can join OSG's research computing facilitators when you point researchers to us. You don't have to do this. You can point researchers to us and we'll do everything to help make sure they get going well. Um, but you can get an account yourself and you can tell researchers to include you in support conversations with OSG. You can join that first meeting. Um, you can also um, do what we've referred to in the past as on-site shadowing at UW-Madison where you travel to UW-Madison in virtual. We can you know, replace that by allowing you to shadow us virtually in meetings with our local researchers at UW or in OSG Connect for a week, making time for you know, deliberate discussion and reflection with you and your team. Um, and then there are ample opportunities for face-to-face -face engagement at Condor and OSG events, um, which will be carried forward in PATH. So these include the OSG All Hands meeting, which is typically in March. We also just did one in August after canceling the on-site in March. So we did one virtually. Um, there's an annual Condor Week in May, but there are a couple of other Condor Weeks at international locales. So one in Europe, one in Asia um, throughout the year. There's the annual OSG school, um, which is a week long summer intensive at UW-Madison for researchers and research computing staff to learn um, the principles of high throughput computing and the practices of running on OSG or even local Condor systems. And then there are numerous trainings, workshops and presentations that we give at conferences on site or virtual and, and other community meetings throughout the year, including workshops like this one. Um, there's a little more here on the OSG school, including links to materials from past years and from our first virtual school pilot, um, which we did, of course, for the summer. Um, and then the last thing that I'll talk about very briefly um, before we wrap up for the day, um, and there's really just one slide for the next steps before we transition to discussion, um, is that having gained whatever confidence you think you need to support your users, you can have an entry point of your own. Uh, a server or multiple servers that your users can log into using local authentication, local data staging resources or file systems, um, a data origin that can leverage OSG caching, um, where you do all of the user facilitation, um, but you don't have to administer the worker nodes effectively. So it's kind of like having another compute system on your campus um, or can be integrated into an existing one. For example, if you have a local Condor pool, your users could submit and have their jobs run locally and to the open science grid through your OSG entry point. And like Frank mentioned, like we've mentioned before, you don't have to share resources for your researchers to benefit from OSG, whether through OSG Connect or your own entry point. Um, and again, your entry point can benefit from the heterogeneity of these different types of resources. Your users could submit in one place and run on all of these different sources of capacity through the OSG, as well as on your local cluster. So I've just got one slide here. That's another summary of all of these services that we've talked about today, building local DHTC capacity, sharing local resources via OSG, which we'll do a deeper dive into tomorrow. Um, how to support your researchers to use OSG, which I just discussed. Um, and don't forget that we provide various types of support consulting um, letters of collaboration for CC star proposals, that all of this is free and open to you and your researchers. And so what's next in the schedule is just to discuss next steps, but then we can sort of quickly transition into um, a really informal sort of panel discussion where we've got representatives from some campuses to discuss with you 
what their experience has been like, as well as any other questions from um, all of the participants here today. Um, so reminder, you and your researchers can use OSG now um, through OSG Connect, go there and sign up. Um, you can write to support at opensciencegrid.org and somebody like me um, will meet with you to discuss which of the services we've described today you might like to engage with and how and to help make sure that you've got everything you need and that you're well supported and coordinated across our teams in implementing those services. And then lastly, if you want to discuss your CC STAR proposal, and in particular, if you would like that not to be knowledge across all of the OSG staff, um, we have a CC STAR proposals contact list that Marone mentioned earlier um, that goes just to OSG leadership um, who would be relevant to informing um, your proposal and a letter of collaboration from OSG. 